So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it has been an extraordinary day, and I have to make my first comment, one of appreciation for Dr. Sutherland and his team, who've done a tremendous job with the program. So. So there is a lot that I could talk about, but I'll start by saying we really have had a profound reflection on some of the most essential things that we need to think about as we lead in surgery. Um, there are a lot of things that we're covering, leadership today, advocacy tomorrow, Hill visits on Tuesday, and just know that your American College of Surgeons is working diligently for you in so many different ways that there is just too much to cover um, in the couple of minutes that I have, but I will, I will try. So some of you have heard me talk about the fact that I am guided, I have been guided since I had the privilege of stepping into this role by our 110-year-old motto, which is to serve all with skill and trust. Uh, it was good enough for Franklin Martin, it was good enough for Codman, it is good enough for me, and it really does guide the way that I think about the American College of Surgeons and what it is that we do and what we have to uh, represent as we think about where we stand in the profession. So when I think about the ways that we um, actually do that and we meet the needs of our members, I've roughly broken it down into what represents the divisions of the ACS. There's a lot more that we do, but this is a familiar construct that we can use to just talk about it briefly. So when we think about quality, some of the priorities for me going forward and working with Dr. Koh, who leads that division of research and optimal patient care, is thinking about how do we have a unified platform to amplify our quality efforts? How do we make it easier for those in the C-suite, for those institutions that want to work with us to engage with our 18 quality programs? We know, because we are clinicians, that higher quality is the right thing to do. We know that higher quality bends the cost curve. We know that diminishing readmissions and diminishing return to the OR and diminishing complications is a way to save money. And that is perhaps what resonates with some of our other audiences. So when we think about how is it that we can engage, we need to think about how to make it easy for those who may not be surgeons, who may not be clinicians, and for whom doing what's the right thing for the patient isn't always at front of mind. Um, we have to think about the quality campaign, which I'll spend a little bit of time talking about later, because we are embracing um, an ambitious goal which is to bring ACS quality programs to every patient cared for in every hospital in this country. And it is ambitious, but that is our goal. And we lean into that um, unabashedly because we know that we can make the care of the surgery patient better by use of our quality programs. Um, education, led by Dr. Sachdeva, um, is another extraordinary place. And so when we think about to heal all with skill and trust, the skill part of that is really education. And so as we think about what's on the future um, horizon, it's bringing just-in-time education. It's mindful that we have to be innovative and meet our learners where they are. And we have learners from medical school up to and through retirement. And so when we think about what is on the cutting edge, um, enhancing collaboration to make sure that we're working with others in this space, um, we are thoughtful about how it is that we make sure that we know what you need as members and that we bring you the education that will help you in your day-to-day -day practice. When we think about member services, again, under Dr. Sutherland's leadership, the heal all, the all part, is that member services piece, which is how do we make sure that whether you are urban or rural, academic or private practice, at the beginning of your career or at the end of your career, we have value added for you. There was a question earlier about how to make sure that um, the chapter brings value. That is what we want to do. So that being a member of the ACS is not just something that you decide whether or not you're going to want to do, but we want to make it impossible that you would not consider as a surgeon of any specialty engaging with us because we bring you so much value. And we've spent a lot of time this morning talking about well-being and resilience and the mitigation of burnout. That is part and parcel of what we do for you um, as members of the ACS. So there is an entire program in place that works on well-being and resilience. There is a committee that focuses on that. Um, there are tips and tools and there are actionable items um, that we provide for you to make sure that we're mindful about workforce issues. And that is impacted by burnout. Um, advocacy, we will have an entire uh, day and a half launching this evening, in fact, of work in the advocacy arena. And Dr. Uh, 
uh, Frank Apelka and Pat Bailey, led by Christian Shalgen, who leads our Division of Advocacy and Health Policy, have put together a really profound and engaging couple of days for you. For those of you who've done this before, um, you know how important it is that we go on the Hill and that we have the conversations with our legislators. For those of you who've not done it before, you are in for um, a treat in as much as you will be told how to have those conversations. And then you will be our voice. Uh, we need you to be our voice on the Hill to talk to those individuals who are not clinicians, who don't know why what we do is so essential and important, and who aren't aware of the specific tips, tactics, and tools that we can provide for them so they can make the changes we need our lawmakers to make on behalf of our patients. And so when we think about having an impact that's beyond surgery and is health system reform writ large, this is where all of you help to amplify the voices of the ACS. And then finally, communications. We have an extraordinary team. Uh, Natalie Bowden and Brian Edwards were relatively new um, at this meeting last year. Um, and they have really transformed the ways in which we communicate, both internally and externally. You've seen some of that. I'll go through a little bit of, of this in the next couple of slides. But again, our goal is to raise the profile of the American College of Surgeons. I want us to be the place that anyone and everyone comes for all of their questions about surgery. I want us to be the gold standard. So rather than believing what someone who um, you know, might have said on Twitter, we need the question to be asked of the ACS, is this true? Is this what surgeons think? Is this best practice? Is this supported by the evidence? And we need to be the arbiter of all things surgery. And again, lots of ambitious goals, but I am convinced that we can get there. So a couple of minutes on communications. Hopefully you've identified um, and received and looked at the redesigned ACS bulletin. We've really spent some time and energy thinking about how to make that a more meaningful document for you, that we are giving you information that you will find important, that we are giving it in a way that is appealing, um, and that we make it easy for you to access it however and whenever you want. So timely updates on what's going on at the ACS that we want you to know about, a much more um, individualized approach. We're leaning even more fully into that. Some of you have heard me say that for the last 10 years, and we continue to make iterative improvements to make sure that what we're telling you is what you care about. Everyone doesn't care about everything. I think that's a truth that we can acknowledge. And when you are the ACS, we have in some cases an embarrassment of riches. We do so much so broadly that we have to help you figure out what are the pieces of that that are relevant for you. And our communication strategy reflects that. So CME eligible activities, uh, making sure that you know how to engage and thinking about how to um, compel the pieces of your practice that we can support, how to bring that to the fore. So you can see there on the right what it looks like um, and that we do have CME eligible activities associated with it. We have a podcast. Some of you love podcasts, some of you hate podcasts, that's fine. Some of you love social media, some of you hate social media, that's also fine. Our goal is to make sure that we meet you where you are. It's going to be a different value proposition for each of you, and so we are committed to making sure that we have multiple ways that we engage with you so that you get the information that you need. So a couple of podcasts, the selected readings, the house of surgery, the operative word, some of these are CME eligible, some of them really capture the best um, uh, talks that have occurred at other meetings. So you might have missed the meeting, but you can hear the, the best talks, if you will, um, on the podcast. So everyone can't go to every meeting. We also recognize that. You are busy, you have practices, you have research, you have families. So everyone's not going to be able to get up, get on a plane, and go to the big box meetings. I recognize that. But we want to make sure that you don't miss out. So if there's an opportunity for us to provide that for you, then we want to do that as well. There is going to be, following on the personalization theme, a even more personalized surgeon dashboard that we will unveil. In fact, some of you in the room have been our beta test group, and I thank you for that. So this will put more of the information that you need at your fingertips, so you don't have to wade through facs.org, which parenthetically is also much improved. Um, but we're putting the information that you need at your fingertips. So it will be individualized, it will be focused on what you need, what you want, right at the tip of your fingers, and you'll see there, I won't read you the slide, but that is forthcoming, and you'll see it this spring, and I would ask you to give us feedback. We think we're getting it right. Um, I've weighed in, lots of our surgeon members have weighed in on the beta test group, and we want to make sure that it suits your needs. So please do um, engage with it and let us know what you think. 
So shifting gears to membership, if you don't know, I, I can't imagine that anyone in this room doesn't know, but if you don't know, we are on a free resident membership pilot. So residents of all specialties, and I think we just went forward, if we can go back one slide. Um, residents of all specialties at US-based programs um, will be able to be free members of the ACS. We believe so strongly in the value proposition that we are happy to engage residents because we know that they'll remain. We know that they will become fellows. We know that once they have access to all of our amazing products and services and the value that they provide, that they will continue to engage with us. So again, I won't read it to you, but if you are a program director, if you are faculty, if you are a resident, um, make sure that you share this information broadly because we have incredibly valuable uh, insights for those in training. We have everything from specialty um, engagement opportunities to practice management modules to all of the things that we know are important across the board. Ethics, communications, advocacy. We may not be the place that you come to get your sub, sub, sub specialty education, but we are absolutely a place that you should engage with um, if you're going to be in the practice of surgery. So we have mechanisms to enroll whole classes at a time, so we try to make it easy for you, whether you're an individual resident or whether you're a program director or chair. Another word on the practice management resources, this is one of the things that I really wanted us to build out when I took on this new role. Uh, we have long had elements of practice management, but it was not in one place. You couldn't go to one place and figure out how to start your practice. I mean, as a former program director, I know how hard it is to teach all of the things we're expected to teach residents in the time that we have. We can't delve deeply into coding and billing and negotiation and the legal matters. I mean, we can touch on it, but that is probably insufficient for most of us when we finish on June 30th and we go out there and hang out our shingle and start practicing. And whether we are employed or whether we are in private practice, whether we're solo or whether we're in groups, you need to know how to do this. Even if you are in the most academic of academic environments, you still need to understand negotiation and you still need to understand the business of medicine. So we have put together a suite of services that will be incredibly valuable, not only to those at the beginning of their career, but I dare say to those who are in the middle of their career. Um, you know, we get lots of questions from people who have negotiated a contract, moved to a new place, the, Private equity folks bought out their practice and what do they do now? I mean, so there are ways that we engage with you at whatever point along your career. So everything from coding and reimbursement to insurances to legal matters and providing you with data. Surgeon well-being, I alluded to briefly, we do have a, a whole suite around that as well. So um, there is a committee, there are engaged individuals, there is research, and we heard some of that in earlier talks today. So please know that we are just um, that we're not just paying lip service to uh, well-being and resilience. We recognize this as a significant factor in workforce. And if we are thinking about the surgery profession of the future, we ignore issues around well-being and resilience at our own peril. And we are committing the resources to working on this and making sure that we provide you um, actionable uh, steps that you can do to mitigate burnout and to stay engaged. And the notion of... Um, of autonomy, which was mentioned a couple of times a day, is important. We recognize that there is not um, some magic wand that we can wave or that you know, yoga and soft music in a dark room at Clinical Congress is going to solve these problems. There are elements of autonomy that we need to um, actively fight for on your behalf because part of the frustration of the practice of surgery is being told how to practice by people who um, I, I will just say who, people who don't care for patients, and I'll leave it at that. Um, but when we look at the leadership of some of our institutions, when we look at those individuals who make decisions, who make us jump through hoops that are just foolishness, that's a frustration for us, and it drives people away from the joy of surgery. So that is continually a priority for us. Um, so join your chapter. I mean, we heard some chapter success stories. Um, there are chapters that are doing amazing work. And while we don't have the opportunity to you know, put, break you into small groups like we, we used to in the past, to have you engage with those in your states, I would encourage you to engage with your local chapter. We know that the best chapters 
have broad engagement. They have young people, they have senior people, they have surgeons of all specialties, and they work together, whether it's with the medical society in the state, whether it's with other um, chapters in the state. We have both multi-state chapters and multi-chapter states. Um, so we want you to engage with your chapter. If you need help doing that, Dr. Sutherland or Luke Moreau or Brian uh, Frankel in the back can help you figure out how to engage more fully. We are as strong as our chapters. So not only do you engage with us at the, at the national or international level, we need to support you where you are, at home, where your practice is located. There are going to be things related to advocacy or related to practice management or related to um, the, the junior people um, who need help or mentors or advocates close to home, and that's an important support structure that we provide as well. Join your chapters. So education. Clinical Congress is right around the corner. Um, you would say, well, no, it's only April, but believe me when I say that we have been working on Clinical Congress since before the last Clinical Congress. So it's coming together nicely. We will have elements of the hybrid approach that you um, experienced last year um, in San Diego. This year's Clinical Congress will be in Boston. I hope to see every one of you there and those online. We hope to see you there. Um, so you can see there on the right, I won't read it to you, but it is going to be a packed session. Um, lots of content, lots of engagement opportunities, lots of camaraderie. Come to Clinical Congress, we want to see you there. We are mindful of the fact that you're away from your practice though, and so we have this year created a bit more efficiency. So the meeting will end on Wednesday afternoon. Some of you will remember that there used to be a Thursday morning session. We've not lost any content, but we have been able to spread that content over the previous days. So the meeting will go through Wednesday afternoon. There will be the annual business meeting of the fellows, to which you are, of course, all invited. Then there will be the Taste of the City event that everyone um, loves, and then that will be the end of the meeting. So we're mindful that you can't be away from your practice for days and days and days, and so we're working on how to make it more efficient for you um, and being respectful of your time. So you can see here we'll have some pro-con debate sessions. There's some new tracks. Again, you'll be able to engage online, but I hope to see you all there in person. Um, and there will be some of the, the key named lectures that will be live streamed as well. So I um, hope to see you in Boston uh, in October. I anticipate registration opening um, in the first week of May, um, certainly by mid-May, so um, sign up early. And um, we, for those of you who remember the, the last uh, meeting in Boston, we've got a lovely new hotel that's been built and it's gonna be great. So I really do hope to see you um, all there. Um, CSEP, many of you use CSEP, both trainees and um, attendings find it incredibly valuable. So we've got the 18th edition, which is out. It has some new features. Um, we have our education um, experts uh, in, the, in the back. I saw Dr. Sachdeva here earlier. So if you have specific questions, um, certainly we have the expertise to answer those specific questions for you, and many individuals um, find this to be an incredibly valuable adjunct to their education. And we have an advanced module that's coming this summer for those of you for whom CSAP is not even enough. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. We just heard a great talk from Dr. Mason, who is the architect of our um, externally facing diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. I would emphasize something that she said, which um, is absolutely true, that at no point have we stepped one iota away from the focus on surgical excellence. That has been and continues to be um, what we do as an organization. So the notion that somehow our ability to engage in uh, building a diverse and equitable workforce somehow requires us to be less excellent than we were before is just foolishness. Um, we continue to engage with excellence. We continue to engage to make sure that we welcome the best and the brightest into our profession. And to do anything less would be um, unsurgical of us. So there is a QR code. If you want more information, please do feel free to take a picture of that. And Dr. Mason is still here and can engage with you if you have specific questions about how, as a profession, this is the right thing for us to do. Quality. Um, in addition to what you heard um, previously about how we're making sure that we incorporate elements of <clears throat> equity matters into our databases, we have leaned fully into the trust aspect of healing all with skill and trust. And so again, if we take that motto apart and we talk about trust, that is our quality programs. That is accreditation, that is verification. Those are our databases. Those are the things that we do in our 18 programs to enhance the care 
of the surgical patient to improve the quality and indeed to improve the improvement process, to coin Dr. Koh's phrase. Because it's not enough that we should give you data, we have to tell you how to use those data so that you can improve outcomes. We had a, a wonderful opportunity on um, Friday to launch our quality campaign. We had many of the uh, C-suite individuals from systems here in the DC, Maryland, and Virginia area. This is something that will be the basis of a nationwide campaign, a multi-year nationwide campaign. And again, our goal is to bring ACS quality programs to every patient in every hospital. So that was our launch. We, we talked about it a little bit. I talked about it a little bit at Clinical Congress, the soft launch, and we officially launched on Friday. But I would highlight for you, arrayed here on the screen, a number of programs. Whatever it is that you do, whatever it is that you do in your practice, we have something that can support you. So when we think about conversations that you have as our surgeon leaders and advocates in the hospital, not only do we have services and programs that will advance you, we have the ability to help you have the conversations with those in the C-suite to make a compelling argument about why our programs are effective. We have those data, we have those talking points. So if you want to engage with us on quality, let us know and let us help you. Um, it is not enough just to say it's the right thing to do. As I said before, that's moving uh, for some people, it's not moving for others. Um, but we can give you the data that you need to have these conversations with those individuals who need to be convinced about the value of surgical quality. And whether you're at the beginning of your quality journey or you've been doing it for years, we have the ability to educate you as an individual because we have skills, uh, we have courses that we've put together specifically to help you know more about quality and how to implement it. So you can see here on the left side of the screen a number of accreditation and verification programs. We've just updated the standards for breast. Um, emergency general surgery is relatively new. We launched that in the fall in conjunction with the AAST. Um, vascular surgery is new. We launched it about a month ago with the Society of Vascular Surgery. So not only is this something that we are doing, we are doing it in collaboration with the subspecialty societies or the specialty societies that recognize that this is a need they have and it's something we know how to do. We've been doing quality for over 100 years. No one needs to reinvent the wheel. Our goal is to be collaborative and to make sure that the patients benefit. So coming soon, high-risk GI and general thoracic surgery. And you can see on the right side of the screen some of the, the standards that we have put out so you can um, literally go and look at what is best practice and what are the standards for best surgical quality. We have over 700 sites, about 20% of them are international, so this is beyond the, the borders of the US. Um, the quality verification program, really the, the fundamental way that we can integrate quality into the very fabric of your hospitals, that is available. You can put your hand up and say, come evaluate my hospital and tell us how we can do quality better. We have a mechanism to do that, and there are hospitals that have signed up for that and are thrilled that they are being recognized by us um, as uh, arbiters of good quality. Um, there are 25 uh, hospitals to date, so if that's something that is of interest to you or your hospital, please do let us know, and we'll get you into the, into the system. We have, as you all know, millions of patient records, more than 100 risk-adjusted models, and really, again, not enough to just provide you your data, but we are able to tell you how to do quality improvement better. It is an iterative process. It is not a single step. It is a journey. And so wherever you are along the quality pathway, you can do better. All of us are at hospitals. We think we're doing great. Our patients are the sickest. Our outcomes are great. But we can all do better. And so our job as the American College of Surgeons is to meet you where you are and help you move from good to great, help you move from wherever you are with however much engagement you have to a place that's further along the pathway. And at that point, again, all of our patients benefit and all of our surgeons benefit. I'll just go back, if you didn't see it on the right side of the screen, optimal resources for quality. Again, if you need that, that book, if you need a primer, if you need to start in the process, we can help you do that. So cancer programs, you can see here standards. Um, I, I won't read it to you, but operative standards for cancer surgeries, for those of you that are cancer surgeons, uh, new cancer protocols, so you can see now available the breast melanoma and colon, so um, very um, actionable uh, elements, and then you can see there's some in-development cancer programs as well. 
So trauma programs, a lot to talk about, but I'll just highlight a couple of things. So um, NTEPs and rural surgery. There was a question earlier, someone pulled me aside, to ask about access um, for those who practice in rural environments. So um, I'll highlight just the, the NTEPs um, element, which is that there's gaps in trauma care across the country. We recognize a level designation that um, is an American, Cancer, uh, American College of Surgeons designation, but what we need is a network that works across the co country and allows us to um, deploy that when there are times of crisis. Um, having a good trauma network is useful even when there are crises that occur, like the pandemic, or like some sort of natural disaster, or military casualty management, or what have you. So this conversation is ongoing. How do we get those lawmakers to engage with us in what we know how to do? We know how to do uh, trauma. We know how to build trauma systems. So how do we do that? And then the rural space, many of our patients, as we know, live in areas that are not urban. So we can't only focus in urban environments or can't only focus in the academic and feel like we're treating all patients. Most of our patients do not get their care in academic settings, they get it in the community. So when we think about our rural surgeons or those who practice in rural environments, what are we doing to support them? So some 30 million rural Americans lack access to level one and two trauma care. So making sure that we can address the preventable death that occurs um, in rural areas. And so we need to develop some, some alternates, um, perhaps engaging in telehealth. I'll say as a side note that we also recognize that there are under-resourced institutions everywhere. You don't have to be rural to be under-resourced. So we have under-resourced urban, we have under-resourced rural. Um, so again, our goal is to recognize how it is that we can improve the care across the board. Everyone is in a different place. Every institution is in a different place. They are resourced differently. And so we have to figure out how to plug the gaps or meet the needs across the board. And it's going to be something different for everyone. So violence prevention, I need not tell this audience that firearm violence is the leading cause of death in children. You know that? I'm gonna say it because it's so incredibly mind-blowing that that is where we are, but that's where we are. And so as surgeons, it's our job to care for these patients and it is squarely in our purview to comment on and try to move the needle on firearm violence. And so we have a lot of work that's, that's gone on. The Firearm Injury Prevention Coalition um, is a group that's been pulled together across different stakeholders, multiple specialties represented, those in medicine, those from the community. So we have been working in this space for decades. This is not new, this is not political. We treat firearm violence as a public health crisis that it is and it has been for quite some time. And we've been in this space, as I said, for decades. Um, so we revise our statements periodically um, from the 80s. We've been making statements about the prevention of firearm injury and uh, minimizing the death uh, from, uh, from injury. So we're working on this from the standpoint of legislation. We're working on it from the standpoint of moving it out of the realm of the political and into where it belongs, a realm of public health. Um, and having those conversations with uh, others in the coalition so that we can move the needle. Um, we would like to think that our um, conversations around this have had some impact um, on legislation, and we would like to think that we can continue to exert influence in a way that prevents um, loss of life and loss of function. And our Stop the Bleed program, you know, we are very excited. Uh, you heard during our, um, our chapter uh, success story that uh, we've been able to get this implemented um, in California, in the city of Chicago, there's been engagement. We um, have recently engaged with the Chicago Cubs. Um, so there's going to be Stop the Bleed kits um, at Wrigley Field. Um, so there are lots of ways in which we're trying to make sure this becomes part of, um, of what bystanders would want to do, the same way they think they should know CPR the same way they should know the Heimlich maneuver, we want people to know how to stop the bleed. I want these kits in people's cars. I want them, you know, they're in the airport. If you've flown through O'Hare lately, you've seen them up um, in O'Hare on the wall. Um, I was in a, an office building and went into the ladies' room and there was one on the wall in there. So, um, you know, we really know that this is something that we can use to teach and train bystanders to save lives. So as much as um, these other things that we've talked about have become part of the common parlance, 
this should be as well, and we are leading this. There are some 2.6 million individuals that have been trained worldwide to stop the bleed, and we would like that number to be uh, much higher. So we're supporting legislation to incorporate this at the state level, at the city level, at the um, federal level, so stay tuned. Um, and if you are interested in engaging with us, please do let us know. So the Quality and Safety Conference, just to wrap up the discussion about quality, if you are interested at all in quality, you should be at this meeting. Um, and not only should you be at the meeting, you should bring others from your surgical healthcare team. This is a meeting that engages nurses, it engages those in the C-suite, so hospital administrators, all of those individuals who are interested in quality benefit from this meeting. This is where we share best practices. This is where you can find partners from hospitals that are similar to yours and figure out how to solve the problems that are plaguing your hospital. We have solutions. So mark your calendars, take a picture. You can see here um, we have the basics, a primer for those of you that may be new to this, and then we have uh, much more engaged work across the entire spectrum. So hope to see you um, in July in Minneapolis, and that registration should be opening in the next week or so. So I'm closing with the power of quality. So again, this campaign, I'm running a minute or two over, so hopefully Dr. Sutherland won't come yank me off the stage. Um, the, the power of quality campaign, um, which is again, part and parcel of our multi-year, multi-factorial campaign to make sure that we're talking to surgeons, to those in the hospital, to payers, because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're paid for high quality and that we engage all of the stakeholders. So our goal in this campaign is to really leverage the credibility of the college with the reach of our hospital partners and the surgeons to engage in our quality programs. So you are our leaders, you are our champions, so we rely on you to help have these conversations. So you can see the stakeholders, we have patients, we have surgeons, the hospital systems, the payers and policymakers, and again, our goal to bring our quality programs to every hospital and every patient. So we launched Friday at the National Press Club. Um, great engagement, we're working with Innova Fairfax, which is a five hospital system here in the, in the uh, Northern Virginia area, but we'll be expanding to more hospitals, more systems. We're thinking about this both horizontally and vertically, so many service lines in a single institution, as well as across systems for hospitals both large and small. So we want to make sure we're taking care of all of uh, those patients, and if you are interested in engaging with us, if you're the surgeon quality champion at your institution and you want to be part of this, if your hospital is at the forefront and wants to do more, let us know so we can work with you. So this is going to be something that you'll start seeing. This is a, this quality diamond, so this ACS Surgical Quality Partner Mark. Um, if you think of it as a good housekeeping seal of approval, if you will, for surgical quality, you will start seeing this. Um, and then in addition to the fact that a hospital may be a quality partner with us, they may engage with us around different things, breast, cancer, trauma, bariatrics, what have you, so you'll see additional diamonds for the specific uh, programs with which uh, they engage. So this is what it might look like. Um, you can see how it might look on social media or in a doctor, um, doctor's waiting room. Um, and so that segues into advocacy because this work around the quality campaign has involved integrated communications and the division of research and optimal patient care and the division of advocacy and health policy. So I will move through this quickly because again, we have uh, two days ahead of us to talk about advocacy, but we are responding to requests. We are positioning ourselves as the experts on all things surgery. So when those on the Hill want to talk about workforce, we're responding. If they're asking for information, we are responding and we're saying, let's talk about the need for more surgeons. Let's talk about where we need surgeons. Let's talk about why surgeons are not included in loan repayment programs. That private practice, I'm sorry, that primary care gets included in. We are as essential to the community's health. So those are the sorts of conversations that we're having to make sure that we are as included as possible and loan repayment programs, thinking about where we need to be and how we can enhance um, care. Um, the Mission Zero Partnership for Trauma Readiness, we are engaging actively in that space and um, uh, have uh, some $11.5 million in, in fiscal year 2024. Um, appropriations to um, allocate funding. We want to make sure that we are at the table, that there are dollars set aside for surgical research efforts. So 
there is a call to action. Ask your elected officials to support our funding priorities. We want the money to go to things that are important to us. And that's where, again, your voice is valuable. Giving to the PAC, I'll say as a side note, I'm thrilled that we've passed the $50,000 mark, so congratulations. <laughs> So at this meeting, we've surpassed $50,000. I would love to make it 60. So those of you who haven't given, make sure you go by and, and donate. But again, we have to participate in the process. You don't have to love it. You don't have to like it. But you do have to participate in it. Because we cannot afford to not have our voices heard. So we need you on the Hill. We need you at home. We need you donating to the PAC. We need you engaging. So these are our efforts. But our efforts fall flat without you and the you know, 35,000 of you that I hope are watching, um, to engage with us in this work. So the Advocacy Summit, you know, here um, you are. We're thrilled that you're here. We want you to engage in the rest of the meeting as well. So it's the Sunday dinner and keynote address tonight, Jim Vandehey and Mike Allen, who are the co-founders of Axios, engaging dinner tonight. Um, Monday, we'll talk about all, again, I won't read them to you, but all of these elements that we will cover to make sure that you're equipped to have the conversations that you need to have on Tuesday. And then Tuesday are the Hill visits. Um, so we will be talking about stabilizing and reforming payment. We will be talking about the prior authorization relief that is a pain for all of us. We'll be talking about funding for cancer research, firearm injury prevention, all of these things that are priorities for us, you'll be talking about. You will be carrying our message and you will be our voice. So I'll close with with this, or I think there's one slide after this. So again, healing all with skill and trust. This is what we've been doing since the founding of the organization in 1913. We continue to have that as our North Star, as our guiding light, as our set of priorities. So I would encourage you to mark your calendars. This is next year's meeting, or we can go back to that. I don't know why it's like I'm motioning up here in the air. But if you can go back to the last slide, because I want everyone to take a picture so that they're here, thank you, next year. So these are the dates, mark your calendar, ask for time off, do whatever you have to do, talk to your partners, because we want you to be here and we want it to be an even bigger meeting. We're at close to 500 um, at this meeting, which is like pre-pandemic numbers, including those in the room and those online. So we would want to see you and all of your colleagues um, next year here in DC. So with that, I will close, and if we have time, I'll ask for questions. So thank you so much for your attention. There's one online. And they wanted to know what kind of resources are available for medical students from the college. All right, so I will answer and then I'll, I'll have Dr. Sutherland weigh in as well because the medical students are part of the member services focus. So again, when I say the division member services has um, programs, products, and services for literally every step along the pathway. We start with medical students and we go up to and through retirement. So we have surgery interest groups at nearly every medical student, uh, medical school in the country, and we have designated leaders, so there's an opportunity to lead even at the medical student level. We have salons that happen online, so if you're interested in learning more about you know, PEDS surgery or ortho or vascular or what have you, we have the opportunity for you to engage as a medical student with those leaders to help you make decisions about career choices. Um, the resident and associate society, the leaders of whom are, are leaders of which are here, um, put together programming so that you can engage with residents who are just literally where you want to be. So they are providing mentorship for our medical students. Um, and I think medical student dues are $40? $25 for all four years of medical school. So it is a nominal expense, and you are literally a member um, for all four years of medical school. So lots that we are doing for medical students. Did I leave anything out? ms at facs.org for more information. <laughs> yes. Great. Thank you so much for such a great overview, Dr. Turner. I have a quick question about retired surgeons. So what the ACS um, is doing or can do to maintain the relationship with the retired surgeons because it can help them and we owe it to them. Uh, it helps their self-worth, the sense of self-worth, their well-being, but also they can be with their life, life, uh, uh, lifelong experience they can be a great source of mentoring and educating their newer generations 
from residents, from medical students to, to, um, to physicians. Yeah, so thank you for that yeah. question. Uh, you know, that is a great point, and we do not want to lose the intellectual capital of our retired surgeons. There are many ways that we want to keep them engaged, um, whether it is, as you've suggested, mentoring, so being a trusted source of information for those who are junior. From a clinical standpoint, I'm having a tough case. From an ombudsman standpoint, um, from a, you know, I had a really tough case, and I need somebody to talk to who's been there before. We also engage them in our, um, as faculty for some of our courses. We engage um, our retired surgeons in our humanitarian outreach effort. Dr. Gurma is in the back. Um, we had a really terrific um, Operation Giving Back strategic planning session. So for those who are interested in humanitarian outreach and in teaching and operating and bringing um, experience to those who are either overseas in our international efforts or domestically where we also have programs, we often engage our, um, our retired surgeons in that regard as well. And we use them because they are still valued voices in advocacy. They're still valued voices as faculty. So there are a lot of ways that we, um, we want to engage and we don't want to lose those individuals who may have stopped practicing but still have lots to give. Thank you. Of course. Dr. Ma. Thank you, Dr. Turner, for your amazing leadership, your wonderful presentation. I was delighted to read the proceedings of the Firearm Injury Summit in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons. The 1964 report on smoking and health resulted from a letter from four organizations, including the American Heart Association and the American Cancer Society, to President John F. Kennedy, asking for the creation of a report by the Surgeon General. Just wondering if there might be the possibility for that coalition of 46 organizations to issue a similar letter to the Biden White House, and possibly to invite the U.S. Surgeon General to the Clinical Congress in October. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a terrific idea, and we have very much thought about ways to make sure that the message is getting to all of the places it needs to go. So you're absolutely correct. We are talking you know, to the legislative arm, the executive branch. I mean, we're making sure that we bring this message forward. I actually can't comment too much on whether the Surgeon General has or hasn't been invited to Clinical Congress. I would have to defer to Dr. Sachdeva on that. But I do know that we are trying to make sure that this conversation is at the highest levels um, and we are um, excited to say that we have the ability to convene, to bring together multiple specialties, those inside of medicine and those outside of medicine. And while we may differ about some things, we aren't differing fundamentally on the fact that you know, there shouldn't be school children you know, murdered in their schools. We can all agree on that. Um, and so we even can have conversations with those who might be outside of where we um, normally talk. I'll say um, as a side note that Christian and I had a conversation um, with the CEO and other leadership of the American Hospital Association. I mean, we agree with them on some things, we don't agree on others, but where we can agree is that you know, safety in the hospital is important to all of us. Um, we all want to be able to go to work. We all want to have a safe environment. That's important to the AHA. That's important to the surgeons. It's important to others. So, you know, thinking about where we can find commonalities and leaning into those conversations makes us all stronger. So that's a great point. We are certainly going to release a, a paper a proceedings from that group and hope to, you know, get these uh, comments heard at the highest levels. Another I online have, question. I have another online question. And then this will be the last question. I'll be around. I mean, yeah. I'm not going anywhere. I'll be here till Tuesday. So I'm, I'm happy to take later questions too. So uh, Nancy Gant asks, um, how is the ACS addressing the private equity purchases of so many profitable medical surgical practices? I'm concerned about surgeon autonomy and the quality of care. So we are also uh, concerned, I think is a, is a fair word to say about that. You know, we are hearing um, about uh, practices that have changed in ways that are not patient-centered. Um, we have um, had conversations about what it is that we can do in terms of educating our surgeons so that they are not uh, caught off guard. Um, and there, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it's a challenge. I don't want to suggest that we have answers, but we are very much aware of the issue. Um, we are going to make sure that education of, of surgeons is important, but we also know that we have moved uh, very much into a situation where many of our members, most of our members indeed, are now in an employed status. And whether they're employed, um, who they're employed by may differ, but we have um, about two thirds to 70% of our members, two thirds of practicing surgeons in this country are employed by someone. So we have to continue to think about what that looks like and how we support those individuals as effectively as possible, up to and including protecting them from uh, those who might have um, business practices that don't align with what's highest quality. So thank you for that question, Dr. Gant, online. 
All right, thank you so much.